All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. All right, um, so just to introduce myself real quick, I'm Chad Butler. Um, I'm a security nerd. I work for a company called Caliber Security Partners based out of Seattle. Um, I'm their managing director of security services. And um, got a family, five kids, a wife. We live up in Seattle right now. And uh, I love the outdoors. So that's me. Um, the idea for this talk came from a few conversations I've had recently with various, uh, both customers and, and uh, partners that we work with on around um, the topic of application security. Um, recently, we've had uh, a, a number of organizations come to us, startups that have built great products, great software products, um, and they get to the point where they've got something to sell, and they go to their, you know, their dream customer, their marquee customer, and they try to sell it to them. Um, companies sold on the product and on the software that they're selling, but then they, they run it through their security team and, and the security team shuts them down. So we've had several conversations where they come to us and say, hey, help us help us get secure enough to win this business or help us prove that, that we are secure. And um, and so in the in the course of that, and in the course of speaking with some of the some of the large software companies in Seattle, um, as well as some of the experiences I've had building software security companies, um, th there's a few things that I want to share that I think are, are really helpful to, to organizations that are that are trying to build a either just trying to build a software security practice because because it's the right thing to do, um, or because you know they're they're trying to sell a product and they can't do it without proving that they're secure. So um, this is from the uh, Verizon data breach data breach investigation report. I'm sure you guys have seen these before. Um, it's, uh, it's the source of breaches. And uh, unfortunately, this hasn't changed very much in a number of years. Application security, or applications, web applications specifically, are still the leading cause of breaches in many industries. Um, and it, you know, there, there, there are a few differences there, like you know, point of sale breaches in, in uh, um, accommodation and, and uh, you know, entertainment industries and stuff like that. But for the most part, web applications are, are, a, are the leading cause of breaches in these, in these industries. Um, the sad part is, like I said, it, it really hasn't changed for at least five years. I mean, it's, it's been, app, web applications have been the source of, the primary source of breaches for a long, long time. Um, and I think there are a few reasons for that. One, the software industry, the software development industry is changing at a very rapid pace. But when you look at what we're doing in the application security industry, we're still applying the same types of tools and techniques that came about when waterfall was all there was. And so it's, it's no wonder that things aren't changing in terms of the, the breaches that we're seeing. We're, we're really not evolving as fast as we should. So I wanna, I wanna talk about some of the things that, um, that I've seen that may be helpful to you, hopefully things that you can take back to your, your shops and, and um, improve. So, um, from the supplier perspective, you know you look at you look at the the list of companies who have suffered major breaches in the last few years. Uh, many of those have fallen not because not necessarily because they're slouches on the IT and the security side, but because they had some third party vendor, some supplier, who left the back door open and somebody got in. And so, you know. I'll, Obviously, if you know if, if if you're looking at these this list of companies, you're you're not wanting to be in that company. Um, you're, you're not wanting to have that notoriety. So um, these software startups, you know, a lot of times it's like, you know, you've you've probably heard the um, maybe may, maybe you have maybe you haven't the uh, the analogy. Starting a software startup is kind of like jumping out of an airplane and then trying to build an airplane as you're falling towards the ground. There's so many things that can kill you when you're trying to start a so software company. Um, and it's every day it's, it's uh, kill or be killed. And so um, this is a, let's see if the video actually plays. So this is kind of what it's like. You know, you're, you're this gazelle running through the African safari, um, running as fast as you can, just trying to keep, keep uh, away from your competition. And you know, not, look up, not looking up long enough to see this uh, tree that's in the middle of the savanna that you uh, run into. So for a lot of software companies, that's what life's like. You're just running as fast as you can. You're running as hard as you can. And, and it's not just true for startups. It's true for uh, most 
software companies, or most companies that develop a software product. Um, developers are focused on um, budgets, features, you know, the next trade show, getting things built and shipped for that. And uh, oftentimes they don't have the opportunity to sit down and, and think about security. So the problem with that is that, of course, software purchasers are starting to catch on to this fact and realizing that they have to apply some scrutiny and some due diligence. And what end, ends up happening is that everybody purchasing software wants to take a more hands-on approach, right? Um, they want to take a look at your software security practice. They want to take a look at everything and find out if you're doing what, uh, what you should be doing to keep their, keep their data safe. Um, one, of the, one of the conversations I had recently within the last couple of months that really led to this, uh, the idea for this talk was um, uh, a, an organization that, uh, so I used to be a customer of a, at one of my last companies. And so I went through their software security practice or their software security verification standard um, as a supplier. I was the AppSec manager for this company. And so I, w I went through this practice. It was very rigorous, very detailed. And um, the, what, what he told me as I went out to lunch with him is he said, you guys broke our statistics. He said, up until you came along, we had a 100% failure rate. Um, and, and he explained his approach was, they wanted software companies to fail so that they could help them get more secure, um, which seems kind of like a backward approach, but they, they were actually very, very good about that. But what we, what we see, unfortunately, is that um, software companies, you know, they'll, they'll go out and they'll try to sell to a big organization, and, you know, this big organization will send them a 30-page questionnaire um, with all sorts of questions that they, you know, they've never conceived of um, answering. Um, they're not prepared to answer. And they'll take two weeks to answer this questionnaire and they'll send it back and there'll be all sorts of problems, um, all sorts of things that they don't agree to. And what, what ends up resulting is that this, you know, this will happen. Um, the, the purchasing company will layer on all of these additional requirements um, to bring them up to speed in, from a security perspective. Um, it's incredibly time consuming for these small shops. Um, and Frankly, uh, you know, a lot of those boxes piled on the on that car are just plain useless. You know, a, a lot of the security controls that some of these organizations pile on, they're not following themselves, first of all, and they just don't add any value. So they're the the um, and and this is this is the other factor that leads to it. Everybody's a special snowflake, right? You know, there's there there are lots of frameworks and standards out there, but nobody wants to use them because they don't apply to my business. They don't apply to my industry. And so everybody comes up with their own. And so you come up, you, you know, you end up with these um, security questionnaires and these you know, special audits that they do that, that uh, you really have no way of preparing for because they're coming from a very specialized industry um, from a, a bunch of uh, special snowflakes. So um, the, the advice I like to give to people um, plant the flag, declare success. So rather than waiting for, you know, somebody to come and say, hey, show me your AppSec program. What are you doing? You know, uh, waiting for that opportunity to arise, go out, do your research, um, come up with a good framework or methodology. Really doesn't, almost doesn't matter what it is. I mean, obviously it, it does. It matters to you. You should do your homework and find out what's best. But the most important thing is that you choose something and that you choose it for an important reason. And, and that you can back it up. You uh, create your, you know, your policies and procedures, whatever you need to, uh, to, to govern your people, um, and, then, and then start doing it, start living it. You know, start, start small and, and work up from there. But most of, these, most of these organizations, as they go and vet their suppliers, they're expecting to go and, and talk to you and for you to say, well, we don't have a security team. Tell us what you want us to do. And that's when you end up like that car with all the boxes piled on top of it. So if you come in prepared, um, and you almost come in with the um, with the uh, the attitude of overwhelming them with so much documentation, so much um, you know research and, and justification for what you're doing, that they're going to look at that and and uh, hopefully be be satisfied with what you're doing. Now, of course, the 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 real purpose is to is to do it right and to do it smart, but um, we want to avoid having to. Uh, having to do a bunch of rework and, and rethink things by, by just being smart from the outset. 
Um, Boeing is actually it, it is a company that has a very robust vendor security program. Um, the guy who leads that has done several talks. You, if you go out and search on YouTube and um, some of the other video sites, you can see those. But the thing that I really like about what Boeing is doing is that they, they aren't keeping their questionnaire to themselves. They've gone through it with multiple iterations and they've perfor perfected it. Um, but they're now sharing that with the, with the community and with the industry so that you can go out and see what Boeing is asking of their, um, of their suppliers. And it, you know, if, if you've got somebody who's asking something that, that seems out of line or, or out, uh, out of the ordinary, um, you know, it's nice to compare it to somebody like Boeing, who's a, a DOD contractor. And uh, you know, if, if Boeing isn't asking for it, um, you know, it, it's probably worth looking at to make sure it's just, justifiable. So you can find this on SafeCode's website. If you go out and look for, um, under the resources link, it's uh, Principles for Software Assurance Assessment. Um, there's a number of questionnaires or questions that uh, that they ask there. They talk about the principles that they go through, and um, honestly, it's it's a good place to start. There there are a lot of different things that you can do in application security, but if you haven't started your program, or you just want some guidance, take a look at this. Um, it's just got got a lot of a lot of good guidance and, and principles to, to go by. One of the questions is this one on the bullet um, or on the slide here. Does the supplier implement a secure development process that includes activities for requirements, definition, design, implementation, and specification? So they're not getting um, overly prescriptive. They're giving you the, the freedom to implement things in a way you see fit, but um, they're, they're also making sure that, uh, that you hit those, uh, those different requirements, those different phases of your SDLC. Um, so one of those, the, the design phase. Um, well, let's talk about threat modeling. Um, this is this is one I like to talk about a little bit. Um, so this is a threat model of a of a very uh, interesting threat. The, the threat is that if you leave your keys in the car and the car unlocked, somebody will steal it. Um, it, it, which begs the question: Did you really need a diagram to figure that out? You know, and and so the question I ask, and I, I'd like to ask everybody here in the room, how many of you are, are doing threat modeling today? Anybody by show of hands doing threat modeling today? Okay, we've got a couple of hands. Those of you who are, do, who are doing it, um, are you seeing good value out of it? Are you seeing good, good support from the development teams? Yeah, some, some head shaking. Okay, great. Um, threat modeling is something that I pushed for a long time early in my career, earlier in my career. And I've, I've kind of backed off of it. And it, it uh, really, the, the reason is, that there are a few reasons. One, um, this, this diagram kind of illustrates that. A lot of times we kind of we kind of know what threats are there. You know, I mean, here, you don't need a diagram to, to tell me that there's a, a threat if I lock my keys, or if I put my keys in my, leave my keys in my car and leave the door unlocked, it's going to get stolen. Um, I had an experience uh, a number of years ago doing a threat model with a, um, a development team. We had you know, all the right people in the room. We blocked off an entire day. Um, we used all of Microsoft tools. We followed their methodology, all of these things. We were doing it just the way we were supposed to be doing. And we got incredible backlash from all of the developers in the room. And you, know, you could kind of sense this tension building throughout the day. Um, and it was kind of frustrating. It, at one point, one of the developers said, hey, we already know where the issues are. Why are we wasting our time in here talking about them? Let's go fix them. And it was incredibly frustrating for me at first because as I tried to explain, you know, the purpose of threat modeling isn't to talk about the threats you already know about, but to find the ones that you don't know about that are out there somewhere and, and to, to address them. But as I've, as I've thought about that experience later, I realized how completely off I was. Um, here a developer was telling me that they knew about vulnerabilities that hadn't been fixed and they were frustrated that we were sitting in this conference room talking about other vulnerabilities that they didn't know about. Um, and looking back on that, I realized I, we, we should have ended the meeting right there and said, let's, let's go fix the things you know about. Let's get those documented. But we didn't. Um, another experience I had, um, so <coughs> I, I, I had the opportunity to interview somebody who was working um, at Microsoft at the time on the Bing team. 
And uh, Bing ships 5,000 releases a year, so multiple daily releases. Um, don't quote me on that number. That's just, <laughs> that's just what I remember. But anyway, multiple daily releases. Um, and as, it, as I was going through this interview, this guy I was talking to, who was very bright, he said that they were doing automated threat modeling. And I, I stopped him. I'm, I'm like, wait a minute. Did you just say automated threat modeling? Um, those, you know, those two terms don't seem to go together in the same sentence in, in, my, in my understanding. And I asked him to explain what he meant. And he said, well, you know, they were doing things. Basically, basically, they were just looking for flags in the code um, where they were doing sensitive operation, touching sensitive data, and flagging that for further review. So what they called automated threat modeling was not really threat modeling in the classical Microsoft case. You know, if you've read the SDL book or read any of the, the threat modeling resources provided by Microsoft, uh, it had evolved well beyond that, um, according to this guy. Um, and I've thought about that since then. You know, if, if, if Microsoft has, has moved on and started, you know, evolving threat modeling to the point where they're, they're not, and, and again, don't quote me on this, I'm not, I'm not a Microsoft representative. I only have this, this one data point. But um, to automate threat modeling to the point where they were just doing a very light touch to find out, you know, to drill down on the things that they really need to look at. Uh, that was very enlightening to me. Um, threat modeling worked really well in waterfall methodologies. Um, something that it's, it's increasingly more difficult to, to fit into the software development life cycle when you're looking at you know, two or three week sprint cycles or daily releases. Um, it's just not feasible to get a threat model in before you ship every release anymore. Uh, but certainly there are some things to look at there. And I want to I want to introduce a, a concept that um, that I used as a past job called task level threat assessment. This was this was meant to kind of address that difficulty of getting threat modeling into the SDLC. Um, so rather than having a, a you know multi-hour meeting where we talked about the threats and you know whiteboarded and all of that, we came up with a very simple eight question questionnaire and. Um, so it was, you know, does this feature change deal with any of these things? Sensitive data, authentication, authorization, password resets, cryptography, third-party libraries, those types of things. And if the answer to all of those questions was no, we'd say, okay, doesn't sound like this, this particular uh, change that you're making is security sensitive, so go ahead and proceed. The idea was that we would, we would take this and, and implement it into the backlog or defect tracking system um, so if you're using JIRA, you know, you can, you can set up a, a workflow where you can go through these questions very quickly. Um, the idea is that if, if, again, if all of the, all of the answers are no, it's not security sensitive, we proceed, you know, just, just do the things that you should be doing anyway. If one of the questions was answered yes, so in this case we are doing, we're, we're handling password resets, then it would branch out and we'd give them a, a number of security requirements. Say, okay, here, here are some specific application security controls that you need to implement as a part of this particular change. And then ideally, what we wanted them to do was to take those security requirements and to put those into the, that particular task as, a, um, as an acceptance criteria. So now as, as that JIRA or that defect or whatever it is goes through the software development life cycle and all the steps along the way, um, development, QA, integration testing, all of these different different uh, touch points are looking this at these uh, acceptance criteria and judging the, the success of this particular feature based on, on whether or not they meet those requirements. Um, what we found is that this, this gave a couple of, of benefits. First of all, um, you know, if, if, if you need to show some auditable standard, this produces produces a great artifact where you can say, hey, you know, X percent of our development tasks were evaluated for security. The other thing is you can you can quickly drill down on issues. If you find an issue that somehow made it into um, production, you can go back and find the JIRA or the defect that was associated with that, find out who answered the questions, and then drill in with them to find out, you know, did they did they just misunderstand it? Did were they gaming the system? Um, or do they have a, you know, a, a lack of knowledge in that particular area? 
and so you can do some some uh, specific training and and um, help them fill up the feed in that. The other thing, and this is this is probably the biggest benefit. Um, this, I, I mean, it, it only takes a few seconds for a developer to run through these things. But what it really does is it uh, it forces a little bit of a context switch. You know, the developer, for just a moment, is no longer thinking about budgets, schedules, timelines, you know, features, and all of those things. But he or she is thinking about security for just a moment. For, forces that context switch. Um, and you know, even if the answer to all of those questions is no, it may it may uh, you know raise a question in their head about some code that they were looking at just the day before, or the week before, where they notice that it, you know it's handling cryptography or it's handling password resets, and they notice the bug there, or they notice that it wasn't handling it correctly. Um, so that I think by far is the biggest benefit that you get out of doing something like this. Just forcing that context switch is a very small one. It's a very brief one, but it forces that context switch in a way that helps developers get into that uh, security mindset for just a moment as they're going through these questionnaires, these questions. And, um, and ideally, that helps, helps uh, fix vulnerabilities in, in code that you never would have seen. So some of the requirements, um, you, you know, obviously, to, to make that work, you have to have a, a predefined set of requirements. Um, there are several sources that you can use. CWE and SANS, uh, the top 25, they produce this monster mitigations list, which has just some, some good best practice recommendations for all development. Um, also, OWASP provides a lot of really great information um, that can be used as security requirements. Um, the ASVS particular, particularly, uh, the Application Security Verification Standard, um, I found was, was really, really a good, good resource. Um, those particular, that particular standard is written from the context of somebody going through and verifying the security of a particular applica application. But it's something you can very quickly rewrite so it becomes a development requirement um, and, and a test requirement at the same time. So um, there's, uh, the other cool thing is ASVS is broken out by risk. So it's, there's uh, three different levels. I think there's actually four, but the the first level is just you know, no security required, which um, I don't think applies most of the time. Oops. Um, but it's broken down into those different categories, where you know, on level one, it might be something that's internal only, not a lot of sensitive data. Level two might be something that pro processes business to business transactions or handles sensitive data, credit card tra information, things like that. And level three, going all the way up to something where you know, loss of life is possible, like an air traffic control system or things like that. So you can you can pull from this list of verification requirements and, and build out your development requirements. Um, the the requirements are cumulative, so you go through and you know you can rate your applications, rank them by risk, and determine if it's level one, two, or three application. And then if it's level one, you know you get a certain subset. If it's a level two, you get all of level one plus level two, etc. Um, it also sets you up for, you know, if, if you want to get a, a pen test that is run and um, goes through the ASVS verification standard, that's something that you can get as well, um, which is nice to be able to hand to a potential customer or business uh, partner to, uh, to show what, what you've been tested against. So here's an example of, of how, how we've set up requirements in the past. Uh, we would throw these in a wiki. So basically, the idea is so here's a this this is straight out of ASVS. Ensure that the application is not susceptible to SQL injection. So that's a high-level requirement. Um, then you give them some development guidance, and uh, generally this would be high-level, um, you know, parameterized queries, you know, output encoding, input validation, whatever. Um, give them some high-level input or some high-level um, uh, requirements or guidance to, to implement that point them out to OWASP or some external resources. But the whole, the whole idea is to, to put it in a, a wiki so that developers can get in there and say, you know, this is how we do it with our stack. This is how we do it with our framework. This is how we implement it here. Um, so it gives them the opportunity to go in and modify that. The requirement stays the same, but they can, they can um, modify the, uh, the development guidance to, to meet their needs. Uh, same thing on the test guidance, you know, give, give QA some some guidance to help them test it, some links to external resources and tools, but then they can go in there and, and make their own notes and, and uh, 
helps uh, help others understand how to do that better. And then those bottom two sections um, applies to, you know, we broke it out, web mobile versus web service, and then required by the trust level, this was the ASVS levels uh, one, two, and three. And so something that they could quickly go through and see, you know, does this apply to me and, and, and hopefully implement it very quickly. Um, before I go on, any, any questions? The other, the other important thing to, to develop, so th these are things that I, I want you to be able to take away to implement um, cheaply, and th these are things that, that have a lot of bang for the buck. Um, the presentation is, is advancing automatically. Sorry about that. So these are things that I wanted you to be able to take back to your shops and, and implement. Um, you know, if, if you're doing nothing, el nothing else, these are great things to start with. So um, secure development training, this is something that you can spend a lot of time and money on. Um, unfortunately, it, it, you know, if, if you were to go out and buy secure development training for all of your developers, it'd be extremely costly. But some of the things that we've seen that, that have worked very well, um, make it hands-on lab-based. You know, I, I've developed a number of training courses for developers where you know, I'll go out and get WebGoat and go through those labs, do some, basically the, the, uh, the framework would be, you know, do some slideware that talks about this, a particular vulnerability, so cross-site scripting. Um, go through and talk about cross-site scripting, what the risks are, how you discover it, um, how you exploit it. And then you do a lab, you know, with WebGoat or, or one of these other deliberately insecure web applications and give developers the opportunity to actually exploit it in the lab. Um, and as they do that, uh, a couple things happen. One, you know, they get to see for, for themselves that it's really not as difficult to, uh, to attack and to, to exploit these vulnerabilities as they maybe initially thought. And that opens up, you know, it's, it's kind of the light bulb moment when they, when they finally realize that, oh, oh hey, this, this really isn't that difficult to exploit. It really is risky. Um, one of the, one of, for me, one of the really fun demos to do with, with developers is to come in with um, uh, Beef, the browser exploitation framework, and show them some of the client exploitation tools, show them some of the social engineering tools. There's um, a few modules that, you know, will pop up a Facebook authentication page, you know, top, you, you, your time, your, your, your login is uh, timed out, please re-authenticate. Um, things that will pop up, you know, an Adobe update notification that will install malware on your system. Things like that, just, just showing that, letting them see it, um, really helps them understand how easy it is to exploit these things. Um, so go through, do, a, do the exploitation lab, then you come back, do a little bit more slideware to talk about how you, how you fix those things, um, secure coding mechanisms and techniques, how you would address that. And then you go back and do the same, same lab, um, or not the same lab, but a, a remediation lab where they go in and they, they employ those techniques to fix the vulnerabilities that they just exploited in the previous lab. Um, so that's, that's a format, a training format that I find works really well for developers. They like to be hands on the keyboard and um, you know, it gives them the opportunity to explore. Those that already know their stuff have the opportunity to explore and dig in and, and reach into things a little bit deeper. Um, and it gives you the opportunity as, you know, as the internal AppSec person or the internal security person to set yourself up as the, as the resident expert in that area so that uh, it, it redirects questions and, and things of that nature back to you. Um, in, in terms of, of uh, encouraging it, Adobe did a, a great thing a number of years ago. They came up with a training methodology or training system where uh, it was mart martial arts belt system. So basically, they had a number of courses that they expected everybody to take. And that was your, you know, your white level belt courses. And then beyond that, you know, you'd have a number of deeper dive courses on the same topics that would get you to yellow belt or green belt or whatever. And then they had um, sort of the, the upper echelon tr uh, developers that were brown and black belts. And those would be things that would require some, some research or some, some additional um, insight where, you know, maybe you, you do some research and write a paper, or publish a, a white paper to the organization or uh, you do a brown bag lunch presentation to the organization and 
teach them about some security concept. So those were that that was a concept that I really liked, something that uh, that worked well for them. Um, you can set up some secure some requirements around that as well, like you know development teams need to have at least one black belt, or they need to have you know certain number that are green belt certified or whatever. So that's that's one way you can do it. The other thing is challenge coins. Um, challenge coins are great motivation for security training. You know, you can go out to Fiverr and get somebody to design your your concept for relatively cheaply. You can put together, you know, go out to a promotional items company and, and order these things. Um, they're they're much cheaper than than you would think to put something like that together. And then another idea is to to use team helmets. You know, you've seen these these miniature team football helmets, uh, college and NFL teams. You can you can buy those relatively cheap, cheaply, and then um, you know come up with your own sticker. It's kind of like the you know the good play sticker. Um, so when, whenever somebody passes a course or does something that you want to recognize, you you reward that sticker. Um, I saw that happen in, in a previous workplace that uh, it wasn't security related, but it was you know designed to to encourage good performance, and uh, people really really liked it. You know they they. They displayed their helmets on top of their cubicles and, and had a lot of fun with it. Um, dynamic scans, you know, this is something that um, I don't know how to how to put this carefully, but we we have a lot of organizations come to us and ask for penetration testing, and what we find out when we dig into things is that what they really want is a as a vulnerability scan with validation, um, which is fine. You know, that, uh, not everybody needs a pen test. But um, dynamic scans are, are fairly cheap and easy to do. Um, it's something that you don't need to spend a lot of money on. There are a lot of free tools out there that will do a, a reasonable job. Um, this is not something that you need to go out and spend thirty or forty thousand dollars on one of the you know magic quadrant uh, dynamic scanning tools. Um, those are great, you know, especially if you're trying to turn that over to your QA team. Um, but something like a Burp Pro license for 300 bucks, uh, you know, in the hands of somebody who is skilled and knows what they do it, what they are doing, um, is a lot better than a $40,000 Web Inspector App Scan license, in my opinion. So, um, you know, come up with a cadence, decide how often you're going to do it, set that up, um, and you know, it's not going to get everything, obviously, but it'll get the low hanging fruit. And it'll get the things that uh, that will be exploited and discovered most quickly when, once it hits production. Um, ideally, do it before each release, but you know, it, at a minimum, I would say do it monthly, if not more often. Um, obviously, the more often you do it, the better. But that all depends on your release cadence and, and how often you're actually releasing code into the wild. Um, penetration testing, it, same thing. You know, come up with the cadence beforehand. How often are you going to do penetration testing? Um, determine when a pen penetration test is required, um, and maybe it's around you know high risk changes, changes to authorization and authentication, integrations with third party, high risk data compliance changes, those sorts of things. Um, and then you know the other thing is that you know I'm sure you all know there are certain things that automated tools just aren't going to find. Um, stored cross-site scripting, um, everyone will tell you that they find it, and that you know, there's, they'll find it every time. Um, but when you really get digging into it, very few of the tools do a very good job in this area. In fact, I'm currently not aware of any tools that do a great job with stored cross-site scripting, um, even on the static side. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult nut to crack. Um, so those are things that uh, are difficult to find without a, without a good penetration test. Uh, business logic flaws, again, something that an automated tool is just not going to find. Um, so, uh, you know, if you can if you can afford a pen test, get that. Um, if not, send some folks, some internal folks, to a class, and uh, and start training them. Um, great way to do it is if if you go out and, and uh, pay a firm to come in and do a pen test, have your guys sit in with them, have your team sit in with with the pen testers if they'll allow it. Um, it's something that, that we allow, we encourage, because, you know, frankly, if we've got those people sitting next to us, we're going to do better work um, because we can shoulder tap them right away and, and, uh, and get answers to questions. They're going to learn in the process, and, you know, frankly, it's, it's uh, 
not exactly a, a black magic art. It's something that we're not um, we're not worried if other people see how we do our how we do our work. So I'm just kind of pulling it all together. This is this is how we typically approach things, and this is this is kind of a, an agile life cycle how we would approach that. So you've got generally four different um, phases or swim lanes: plan, develop, test, and production. So in our plan phase, this is where we have our, our task level threat assessment. These were, this was the you know the eight questions that you go through for each change, each feature request, each JIRA, or whatever you're doing. Um, uh, those requirements that come out of that process become the acceptance criteria for that uh, for that work item. Um, and then as, as they go through the, into development phase, so your security or your developers are hopefully coding to, to those requirements. And um, hopefully they're also developing unit tests um, for, those, uh, for those security requirements to make sure that they're properly implemented. Um, there's some great stuff out there on uh, test-driven development, if you've, if you've heard of that before. There's security test-driven development, which is kind of along the, those same lines. If, if you're not familiar with that, test-driven development says that you shouldn't write code until you have a test um, to make sure it's working properly. So you write, the, you write the test, make sure it fails, and then you write the code to make that test pass, which seems kind of backwards, but it, it, you know, it makes sure you've got great coverage on your, on your unit tests and your functional tests. Um, you can do the same thing for security tests, really. You know, you can make sure that, um, you know, everything is getting validated for proper input. Everything is being properly output and coded um, and those sorts of things. So if, if, you've got, uh, if you've got developers who are on board with the test-driven development uh, methodology, try to turn them on to security test-driven development. And there's some resources out there that you can find that, uh, that give you a good place to start with. Moving into test. You know, obviously, dynamic and static as application security testing is is great. You don't have to spend a lot of money on it, um, despite what most vendors will tell you. Um, you know, you can you can get started small and, and work up from there. And then make sure that uh, whatever you do, you're you're logging your defects, you're tracking them, um, and making sure that you're you know you're meeting your SLAs for closing those vulnerabilities, and, and hopefully that you're actually getting those. Um, getting those fixed before they go into production. Um, and then moving into produ production, making sure that you've got good reporting and metrics. Um, if, if you haven't looked at ThreadFix, uh, it's, it's a great project developed by the, uh, the uh, Denim Group. Um, open source, there's also commercial options. Um, and uh, it, it, the, the thing I love about, about um, ThreadFix is that you can pull all of your vulnerability sources into one place. Um, it'll it'll consume your vulnerability information from a lot of your automated tools, um, as well as allow you to just manually input them. Um, and then you can actually open your Jira, open your defect directly from ThreadFix. And the cool thing about that is that now you've got you know your your defect logged um, in the system that the developers use, but you've also got it over here in, in your system in ThreadFix. Um, as the developers go out and close it, you know. ThreadFix will actually check Jira, and as the uh, as the Jira is closed, it will it'll change the, the little bug icon to indicate that it's closed. At which at which point you can go through and, and verify that it's closed before you actually close it out of your system. So it's a great way to, to manage that and track it. Um, if you've ever managed a lot of vulnerabilities in a in a spreadsheet, um, you'll you'll see the value in that. And then make sure that you uh, you take those lessons learned and go back and provide whatever issue specific training is needed to address those issues in the future um, to make sure your developers are keeping up to speed with, with the latest development. Um, one of the biggest principles that I, I find um, that I think is probably the biggest stumbling block for most application security programs is that they fail to win the hearts and minds of developers. Um, getting, so the benefit of taking the time to do this properly is that you'll have developers on your side. They'll be looking for things. They'll be interested. They'll be, you know, closing vulnerabilities that you didn't even know existed. Um, I, I had an experience once, two, two experiences where we were working with the same team um, to, to close some vulnerabilities that we discovered during the static analysis. And um, 
we went to the uh, to the, the project manager, or the development manager, and said, "Hey, here's some vulnerabilities we want you to close." And he put up a lot of resistance. You know, wanted to make sure that they were, you know, why we wanted to fix them. Wanted to make sure that things were scheduled appropriately and all of this. Um, the same team as we were meeting with them, there was a developer at the table, and. Um, as the meeting closed, he was checking in the code of the vulnerabilities that we had disclosed that he had just fixed during the meeting. So it's it's activity like that that you really want to encourage. Um, I'm sure that the dev manager wasn't pleased by that, but he was making good use of that meeting time. He was fixing vulnerabilities, and frankly, I was I was happy because he was he was taking care of the issues that we wanted fixed. Um, if if you win their if you take the time to win their hearts and minds and and get them on board with this. Um, They'll be your eyes and ears. They'll be finding issues in the code that, again, you would never find with your tools or with your testing. But because they're in the code every day, um, they'll find those things and, and hopefully fix them without you having to prod and, and pry it out of them. Um, if you take the approach that some security teams take, which is you know my way or the highway, um, those development teams will probably do everything that they can to circumvent you and to get around your process and to and to uh, not do what you want them to do because they don't see the value in it. So the first thing is, I, I think, is demonstrate the value of it. Demonstrate that you're bringing value to them. Um, don't just bring them problems, but show them how to fix it. Bring them solutions. Take the extra time to explain why it's a big deal, why you want them to fix it. Um, second, go to them. Don't require them to come to you. So use the tools and the processes, the um, systems that they're already using. If they're using JIRA, you know, don't don't require them to come to ThreadFix. By all means, go and open the open the bugs in Jira for them, so they they don't have to come to you. Um, the whole point is, you know, make it so that the path of least resistance is the secure way. Don't uh, don't make it so that it's so much more difficult to get through your process that um, that nobody wants to follow. Um, <clears throat> a, a particular bad ex experience or bad uh, example of this, I I had the the unpleasant opportunity to work with a particular software company, very large software company out of Europe. And um, they had a very, very robust and mature app set program. It's very academic. And um, they came in and, and you know, said, these are the things you've got to do. Um, and uh, you know, didn't take the time to, to really explain why, just you know, this is it. And um, I did some research and looked at it and, and did some estimation and realized that to do everything that they wanted to do would have required 40 developers every year doing nothing but those things. So 40 man years um, per year doing doing security to implement their, their process. Um, took that to the, the development managers and senior leaders and they said absolutely not, of course. Um, so it, it's stuff like that that I think we really have to have to watch out for. That same company, um, they, they had a, a process, a pre-release process that took two weeks to get through where they, where they validated security. It was two, two weeks long security check before you could push into production. Um, they, they wanted to get into more of a DevOps mindset and so they, they whittled that down and, and they were patting themselves on the back. They got to the point where they could, they could do that same amount of work in four hours. So somebody took four hours to you know, do all of these uh, questions, answer all these questions, and put together an email that passed that off. And um, this was seen as a huge win. And of course, I mean, two weeks down to four hours is a huge win. But think about that for a second. If you're that guy that spends four hours every day, that's half of your day, putting together an email so somebody can ship software, that's a pretty miserable existence. And it's still four hours. If you're shipping on a daily basis or multiple times a day, that's four hours per release. Um, it just doesn't doesn't work. It doesn't work today, um, unless you've got tons of spare resources that you can throw at that. But you know, <coughs> all of these things can be automated and, and uh, developed to the point where you don't need to spend tons and tons of time doing that. Another thing, um, and this was brought up by the uh, by the folks at Boeing in that uh, software assurance uh, assessment methodology. Um, they they really like this uh, ISO 27034 methodology or standard. Um, it's it's uh, still fairly new in the sense that there's no auditable standard. You can't go out and get a cert certification for this yet. 
Um, I've heard it's in the works, even though the website says that it's been canceled. Um, but the great thing is you can still go out and, you know, learn from this and align your, your process and your, your practice with this. Um, so, you know, we got a lot of value out of not being able to say that we're certified by ISO, but we're aligned with its standard. It's an international standard. It's well thought out. And um, if you go and purchase this standard for 100 bucks or whatever, whatever it is, there's some great, um, great templates and resources that you can use in that document. Finally, um, a few words on just the reporting and the metric side of things. Um, these are things that, uh, that, you know, obviously as you're, as you're building a, a software security program, you need to be able to show that you're, have, you know, that you're making a difference. Um, you need to be able to justify the, the money that's being spent on that. And uh, being able to show pretty charts and graphs to, to executives is, is always a good thing. Um, but I wanted to point your attention to the one on the lower right. This is, this is a um, dashboard that we came up with that, that I feel is really compelling. Um, so basically what you've got is your, your list of applications on the left, up on the right, or up on the top, you've got your list of um, requirement categories. And uh, the idea is that you know, if, if you have no vulnerabilities in that particular category for that application, the, the light is green. You know, if it's a green, green circle, you're good. Um, if you've got a medium risk vulnerability in there, then you know, it's, it's yellow and you've got a number off the side that tells you how many vulnerabilities are there. And same thing for, for red if it's a high risk vulnerability. So this is something that it's, it's easy for executives to see you know, where are my application security risks? Where do I need to uh, apply the focus? And um, anytime you can share this in a way that um, it uh, fosters a healthy competition between uh, you know, teams and application development groups, it's a good thing. And the final thing that I wanted to, to leave you with is there's this, this concept in, in the startup landscape, the software startup scan landscape, where um, Paul Graham has said, do things that don't scale. And the, the idea is that, you know, as you're starting out, um, you have the flexibility to do things that don't necessarily work at large scale. Um, so if, you know, if you're a software startup, like, uh, um, uh, I can't remember the name of, of the, the software startup, but, you know, they talk about doing develop, or not, not development, but delivery for restaurants, you know. And at first, they had, all they did was throw up a website with a phone number, and the phone number went to the, the founder's cell phone, and, and when he got a call, he would run over to the restaurant and deliver it to, uh, to, to the customer. Um, those are things that you know, a, a large enterprise can't do, but as you're starting off in software security, you can do those sorts of things. Um, I had a meeting once with a, with a sales executive from one of the, the major security tool vendors, and um, they were trying to pitch us on a, you know, an enterprise dynamic analysis platform. Very expensive, um, very feature rich, uh, and you know looked great. But this this salesperson brought with them, um, I think it was their CTO or um, anyway a C level on on their security side, and um, he said flat out, I I wouldn't recommend that you start with this. I'd recommend that you just pick one vulnerability and just test for that. Pick SQL injection. Go out and test for it. Make sure you get really good at that. And then move on to the next one. And I don't think the, the sales executive liked hearing that. We didn't end up buying the tool. But um, I've thought about that exchange a lot since then. I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. Um, don't try to boil the ocean all at once. Pick something. You know, um, If you're struggling with SQL injection, um, focus on that. Uh, Cross-site scripting seems to be a, a very prevalent issue. I don't think we do an AppSec pen test without finding some form of cross-site scripting somewhere. Um, we don't see a lot of SQL injection anymore, thankfully, uh, except in cases where you know, it's a, a breach response. But we still see a lot of cross-site scripting. Um, focus on that. You know, find a tool, find a, you know, whatever you can and, and focus on that. Um, and then expand from there. Um, same thing with reporting. You may not have a fully automated reporting framework. That's okay. Put it together in, in a spreadsheet. You know, do whatever it takes to get to, to get the traction you need um, to get your message out there. And then as you do that, you, you get to you, you start getting traction. You start to, to win the developer, developers' hearts and minds. Um, start shining a light on the issue to executive management, and uh, 
that's when the funding starts coming, when you can start doing things that will scale. So that's it. Any, uh, any questions? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, um, are there web app firewalls or RASPs that, uh, that can be recommended to, to help kind of a stop gap where you're getting this program up to, up to speed? Um, yeah, there, there are a lot of great tools out there. I, I'm not going to recommend any of them by name because they, I mean, they all have their pluses and, and minuses. Um, the, the only challenge is there that as soon as you put a WAF in place, then you know, your developers might come back and say, well, you know, it's not exploitable, so why should we fix it? Um, so, yeah, WAF is a great, great tool, great, great technology, but um, I'd say it, it shouldn't be a replacement for secure coding and kind of something like this. Thing. But great question. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you. My email and phone number up there if you want to contact me afterwards. But, um, yeah, appreciate you coming. Thanks.